Hi there. So welcome to model 4, IAS 20. This is also closely related to IAS 16, Property Plants and Equipment. And uh, in, these, uh, in the beginning, we, uh, as we dealt with IAS 12, we look at IAS, uh, as we dealt with IAS 16, we look at IAS 20, there we will continue with IAS 23, we will look at IAS 38, we will look at all those IFRS 5, because all those relates to asset standards and we look at all those things later on. Right, so what are we going to be going through in this module? We should be able to understand the recognition criteria for grants, uh, the measurement basis for grants, as well as the disclosure requirements for grants. Right, so what is the objective of IAS 20? The objective of IAS 20 is simply to prescribe uh, for and disclosure of government grants and other forms of government assistance. That is what we want to look at in relation to government grants. What is the scope of this accounting standard? IAS 20 applies to all government grants and other forms of government assistance However, it does not cover government assistance that is provided in the form of benefits in determining taxable income. It does not cover government grants covered by IAS 41, Agriculture, either. The benefit of government loan at a below market rate of interest is treated as a grant as well. So these are what refers to as the scope. Now, the idea about government grants comes to play if we are talking about how we have to uh, buy an asset or undertake a business. So for instance, the government can put a proposal down and say, any business that will buy an asset uh, that will undertake a certain kind of investment, we're going to be giving you a grant. For instance, if you were going to uh, open a business in the Upper West uh, region and you're going to employ uh, seventy percent of the seventy percent of your employees will be from the Upper West region, and you're going to buy your raw materials from the farmers there in the Upper West region. If you're able to meet these conditions, or if you are willing to meet these conditions, then we as a government will give you fifty million dollars grant. Remember, grant is not freedom. Grant is giving on the upon the fulfillment of a condition. So the first question we need to ask ourselves is, what is the recognition criteria for the grant? Another thing also is about grants is that sometimes the government will say, okay, for instance, if you're going to make an investment or you're going to invest like that in the Upper West region, if you need any loan at all, we're going to give it to you below the base rate or below the current interest rate. So if the current interest rate is, let's say, 15%, uh, for normal investment or for normal uh, 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 loan facilities, because you are making an investment in the Upper West region, we are going to give it to you at 70%. What we are seeing here is that that reduction in the interest that we are paying amounts to what we call grants as well. And so that one has to also be accounted for according to IAS 20. Right, so Basically, there are two recognition criteria uh, criteria for uh, grants, for recognizing grants. One, the first recognition criteria is the company will be uh, meeting the conditions required for the grant. So as I mentioned, you are going to open a business in the Upper West region uh, and you're going to employ, your employees will be 70% from the Upper West region. You're going to buy all your raw materials from the farmers there. If you meet this condition, we'll give you $50 million. So before we can recognize that as a company, we have to be willing to what? Abide or accept and behave and do things according to the laid down condition. Then the second criteria, which is obviously uh, not really a key criteria though, but it's part of the, it, we have to look at it, is that the money will be received. So the first thing is, we will satisfy the requirements, and the second thing is the money will be received. Sometimes the government can do what we call a lip service. And so they can tell you, you can hold a meeting with a minister because, or, or, or an MP, or, because, uh, or whoever, because they just want a business to be there so that their people will be employed, so they can just 
do something a lip service and say oh we'll give you 50 million dollars but in reality they won't give you anything at the end of the day so one we have to make sure that we are meeting the condition for their grant then two that we will receive the money if these two things are correct then hey we can go ahead simply and recognize the grants in their financial statements right so let's look at the treatment or accounting for grants how do we account for grants very simple there are two ways also that we can account for grants in the financial statements two sorry first is that grants can be accounted for or recognized as a deferred income or two by deducting the grants from the assets carrying amount so let me take you through that so let's say for instance we buy an asset and then the cost of the asset so we buy a property let's say we buy a property plant and equipment at a cost of let's say one thousand dollars and so the economic useful life of the asset is let's say 10 years and let's say that the government says hey because you bought that asset we are giving you a grant of um, 200 dollars what we are saying here is that you know this property plant and equipment will be accounted for according to IAS 16 we are not focusing on that what we are focusing on now is about the grants this 200 dollars and we are saying that it can be accounted for in one or two ways. We can account for it as a deferred income. Now, if we are accounting for it as a deferred income, the treatment is that first, we're going to be debiting our cash book. That is, if we receive the money or maybe receivables, if we have not received the money yet, without $200, then we will credit the grant or if you want deferred income account which is in the balance sheet, or the statement of financial position, 200. Now, since we are going to be treating it as an income, as a deferred income, we are going to amortize it or spread it over the economic useful life of the assets. What it means is that every year, so annual transfer to the income statement, we are going to divide this 200 by the economic useful life. So that is going to be $200 over 10. And 200 over 10, that's going to be 20, am I right? $20. So every year, we're going to be transferring $20 into the income statement. So what is the double entry? We're going to be debiting the grants account or the deferred income account with the $200. Then we credit our income statement. Did I say $200? $20. And then we credit our income statement also with $20. This is how we account for the grant if we are treating it as what? A deferred income. Very, very simple. So you don't recognize the whole 200 as an income for this year. When that happens, you have breached the matching and accrual principle in accounting. When that happens, it means that you, are, you will be overstating the profit for this year or the current year and you will be understating the profit of what? The future year. So we're going to be treating it by debiting receivables or cash book, as a, whether the money is received or not. Then we're going to uh, credit the grant or the deferred income account. Then every year we make an annual transfer from the grant or deferred income account into the income statement. And we're going to be dividing the grant with the economic useful life of the asset because we received the grant due to the acquisition of that asset. So that is the first thing about grants, deferred income. The second method is by deducting the grant from the assets carrying value. So this is where we say that, hey, listen, we don't want to go through this thing every time. So all we do is that what is our asset? So in that case, we're going to be debiting still our cash or receivables, depending on whether we receive it or not, 200. But this time around, okay, 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 we are deducting, right? Yes, we are deducting. Then we're going to credit property, plants, and equipment, 200. What it means is that by this one, we are reducing the value of the property, plant, and equipment. So now, the property, plant, and equipment will no more be 1,000 because we are crediting it with the 
grant, which is 200. So we are subtracting the 200 from the 1,000, and that will be left us, that will be left us with what? 800. So with this 800, it means that every year we will charge depreciation. And the depreciation is now going to be 800 over 10. And that is going to give us 80. That is the depreciation. So for every year, we're going to be debiting the income statement 80, and then we'll credit property, plant, and equipment with 80. Unlike when we treat it as a deferred income, what is going to happen is that with a deferred income, our depreciation will be on the 1,000. So it's going to be 1,000 over 10, and that is going to give us what? 100. So every year, we will be that we would have been charging depreciation of 100 and bringing in a grant of 20. So technically, you will see that we are charging a depreciation of what? 800. But if we decide not to treat it as a deferred income, then we can just deduct it from the current value of the asset. So technically, we are charging a depreciation of 80 here. So you will see that when we do the depreciation, it will also be what? 80. Yeah, these are the two methods that can be used in relation to uh, treatment of grants in the financial statement. Now, you you are not going to be choosing whether what is good or what is not good. They are all methods by the uh, accounting uh, by this accounting standard, and they are all allowed under the accounting standard. So, if there is a question about grants, you can decide which method you want to go for. Whether you want to go for this or you want to go for that, all will be the same because technically all will lead us to have the same answer. Because at the end of the day, the income statement is being debited with 80. Then if you look at this side too, technically the income statement will be debited with 80 because we are crediting it with 20 and we are debiting it with what? Uh, 80. So when we subtract it, Sorry, we are debiting it with 100, crediting it with 20. So when we subtract it, we'll be left with what? 80. So at the end of the day, the effect will still what? be the same. So the choice is yours in the exam or you can decide to recognize the grant as or treat the grant as a deferred income or just subtract it from the property, plant, and equipment and then you go away. I think that... This one has a lot of jobs to do. When we recognize it as a deferred income, it has a lot of work to be done. But if we just subtract it out from the assets, then we take our minds off it. But usually, it is the treating it as a deferred income that most businesses and most entities use in relation to how they recognize grants in the financial statement. Now, so the final thing I would want to talk about here in relation to grants, it's about, now there's another question that you can look at in the course outline that you can consider in that case. I, I used an illustration here, but in the course outline there are other questions, there is another question that you can look at. Finally, about grants is um, disclosure of government grants. Now, IAS 20 requires that businesses make the following disclosures. One, the accounting policy that they adopted for the grant, as well as uh, the methods for the presentation, the nature and the extent of the grants recognized in the financial statement. So what is the nature of the grant? Was it uh, an interest reduction? Was it a physical cash we received? Was it a land we received? Or what is the nature of it? We need to look at that. Then, unfulfilled condition and contingencies attaching to recognized grants. So if there are any conditions that we have unfulfilled, but because uh, we can fulfill it as and when we continue to operate, we must disclose all that as well in the financial statements. Note that government assistance are not included or are not supposed to be recognized according to IAS 20. So for instance, if government gives technical or marketing advice in relation to the uh, business we are going to be doing in the Upper East, that kind of service, that kind of assistance, we can't place value on it and say, let's recognize government grants. But when the government uh, gives us other benefits like land and other things, uh, we can find out the fair value of the land and then recognize it in the financial statement and treat it as a grant and then amortize it over the economic useful life of the business we intend to do 
at the location. So these are what you have to understand about grants. A very brief discussion about it because it doesn't entail a lot of stuff. I'll see you in the next module as we talk about other things in relation to asset standards and we'll be talking about borrowing cost IAS 23. So I'll see you there.